everybody. We're under a new format. We're not doing Zoom as much as we're now going through YouTube. So grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior. Welcome. We've got a Bible study for you. Uh, we've been working on the prophets, and uh, I want to take the prophets in a different way. Uh, I want to show you that these are really givers of hope, givers of grace, as opposed to our traditional view of prophets. And at this point, we're going to get the first slide coming to you in just a second. Because we normally think of prophets as the hairy guy on the corner with, guess what, kids? You're going to get it. Prophets may say something is going to come to an end, but an end can also be a beginning. The prophets move us from judgment to hope. Let me give you a great idea of what I'm talking about. Thursday, I made some calls in Exurb and Suburban Lennon, and you could see all the stuff poking up out of the ground, all this wonderful green stuff. And then the person I went to see said, well, you know, I got to rake this stuff because underneath here, underneath here is all the flowers and everything else. Next slide. My, my The old legendary Thomas Magliozzi, who unfortunately we lost way too soon to Alzheimer's, used to have a number of sayings in the show he shared with his brother, Raymond. First one is, are you wacko? Against what everything seems to be, against the stupidity, against the pigheadedness, against the room. God is doing grace, and God asks us to become unencumbered by the rational thought process. God asks us to look beyond, not to what is or what was, but what can be and the new that is yearning to be born in the remains of what's happening now. Next slide, please. This will give you an idea of the time period we're talking about, and we're going to be dealing with today, Isaiah, and actually it's going to be today and a couple of other days. We're going to be dealing with the school of Isaiah. Isaiah is a prince like the major prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. He's part of the leadership of the kingdom, in this case, the southern kingdom. And he will, in a sense, start a school of prophets. All the prophets have school, schools. Look at Elijah. Look at many of them. They're known as the Nahbi. Isaiah will have someone who will take over from him and someone who will take over from him. It's seamless. That's why maybe in Sunday school you learned that somehow Isaiah lived 200 and some years. Well, that would have been great. But the situations are different. Next slide. All right. We're going to be focusing on today and probably the next session, exile. What is exile? Exile is, I want you to think of Dorothy and Toto in The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy looks at Toto and say, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore where everything turns over. What is, is no longer. We are not here. We are not there. All the old answers, all, everything has been reshuffled. Think of Pearl Harbor. Think of the Kennedy assassination. Think of Robert Kennedy, Dr. King. Think of 9-11. Or maybe the flip side of that, think of when we landed on the moon but we survived the alleged Y2K. Things can also be new. Okay, let's go to the next slide. We'll deal with some of these other things later. Prophets ask us to move from anger and helplessness to pain and imagination. I'm gonna be dealing pretty much with uh, 
Isaiah, uh, the 40th, the third verse, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert the highway of our God. What is happening here? You have to remember is that Israel, excuse me, Judah, has been trying to buy peace at any price. And to do that, the kingdom sold its soul. God has bailed them out, but things still aren't right. Remember in the call of Isaiah, where Isaiah is in the temple. Ezekiel, the king, the boy wonder, has got leprosy. And when the king has leprosy, the whole kingdom has leprosy, maybe not of body, but of spirit. That's why when the king in Hamlet is bad, someone says there's something rotten in Denmark. It affects everything. And against this, the new terrorist superpower, Babylon, comes. Excuse me, Assyria comes. Assyria locks up Hezekiah, locks up the people. Everything seems to be taken away. In Assyria's great cities, there were statues being carved to talk about how the kingdom of Judah is destroyed. The Rab Sheki, which is the ambassador of the king of Assyria, puts down everyone and everything makes them look helpless and hopeless. But God has other plans. Have you asked God? And archeological evidence has been found of these great walls of triumph being stopped. Hezekiah is shut up like a bird in a cave, but somehow, it is those forces that fail. Take a look sometime at the 27th Psalm. If you want to know more about the rap Shecky, or as I always like to call him Shecky, he's in the 36th chapter of Isaiah. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this change, in the midst of everything back and forth, Isaiah says, breathe. Take a deep breath. Listen, hear, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make a highway for our God. Isaiah is asking us what is crooked, what is burnt out, what is destroyed, what is so warped. It's there that God needs to come. It's there that hope needs to be built. And if you're already thinking, aha, I've heard this, you're absolutely right, you've heard it. You hear this again and again and again, because Isaiah is in the hope business. In Isaiah 9, and I really should have had a slide with this, Ahaz, who is one of the previous kings, sacrifices his eldest son, okay? Remember all that goes with the eldest son. They are the power, they are the hope, they are the future. Sacrifices him, slits his throat, burns his body in the valley of the awful. And Isaiah says, for unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given, and we shall rejoice like they. Do you get the idea that even in the midst of this impossible stuff, hope is coming. And hope, remember, in Hebrew is the same word for umbilical cord, that connection. Get you up unto a high mountain. Sing to Jerusalem. Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judea, here is your God. Okay? You probably have figured this out already. It's 
the Messiah from Handel, by Handel. Handel was a good Lutheran who, like Bach, always worked Luther into whatever he was doing. But Handel was a very depressed man, believe it or not, in spite of all that beautiful trumpet music and Baroque brass. He thought life had passed him by. He went to sleep, hoped he would die, but instead he was filled with a vision, a vision of the God-made flesh, which is talked about again and again and again throughout Isaiah. And within a day, he wrote the Messiah. Think about that. That in the deepest moments of existential despair, when God has called out a time out, God is doing grace against the crushing power, against the big trouble that is coming. There's this beautiful part in Isaiah, the 14th uh, chapter, uh, especially, that there's so many oohs and ahs and e that in spite of all this, God wants to do grace in, with, and for you. That God is not finished. That the final word is not judgment. Next slide, if you please. Yeah. Can you hear this now? Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground will become level. The rugged places plain. Where are those places in you? Where are those places in your relationship? Where is in the 35th chapter, the den of jackals? Where is that royal highway? Where is that relationship with you and God? Thomas Hood said it so best. God, I wish we could be as close as we were when I was seven years old. Where are those places? Isaiah is shouting in the wilderness of a God that is still deeply and passionately committed to you and to the people of God. That God is doing something daring against sin, which ultimately is we blew it. We didn't do what we are called to do. The word sin comes from something that David did. Remember the prophet Samuel says, because you have shed blood, because you have numbered your people, you cannot build a house for God. David instituted the draft, and at the draft, he basically put you about two feet away from a wall and said, hit it with a bow and arrow. How could you miss? That's what sin is. In Greek, it's hamartia, which means to miss the mark, but not even that can separate you from God and what God wants to do. Next slide, please. Okay. This next slide is important because we're making some moves here. God does not want you to be in despair. Now, I want you to think about this because we have this kind of Old Testament attitude, as one of my buddies used to say, that God is the cosmic bully, that God somehow is out to get me. It's kind of what we do with the Old Testament, isn't it? We use it as a club to basically get us to shut up and believe. Rather, it is, it is first and foremost a declaration of love, a declaration of grace, a declaration of a God who from the beginning has been passionate for creation. As the psalmist says, what is man lower than the angels? Yeah. Listen to this. For a brief moment, I have abandoned you. This is reality. Actually, God didn't abandon you. People abandoned God. That's what God's wrath is. When we decide to go and do all this happy stuff and then, uh-oh, or to quote the legendary philosopher Scooby-Doo, uh-oh. But here, listen. 
did not abandon you. And abandon means I did not leave you in Greek. It's orphanos. That means without a loving parent, but with deep compassion. Now, we look at our heart for compassion. But to the Hebrew, it was the deepest part of your intestines that God is so moved in God's deepest parts. I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I, I hid my face from you for a moment. Remember, when God gets mad, God always picks a lover's quarrel. Think about that. God gets mad. God picks a lover's quarrel. We have a hot, passion God. But God does not want the anger to be left standing. Remember both testaments. Be angry, but do not cause yourself to sin. Don't let, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Everlasting kindness, I have had compassion on you. So says the Lord, your Redeemer. And this word is important, Redeemer. Redeemer means to buy back, to pay the interest, to buy back something that can't be bought back because it's out of your price range. It's something that someone in love does for someone who is loved. I have bought you back without interest. You've been in hot to sin, death, and the devil to quote Luther. But I don't want that to be the final thing. Wait, but don't wait in despair. I hope this is making some sense to you. I'm going to try and kind of flesh this out a little bit more in the next couple of minutes. So next slide, please. I call this the good news plus, okay? How beautiful are the mountains, are the feet of those who bring the good news, who proclaim peace, who bring glad tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns again. Think about this in the Messiah. Think of those voices soaring. Behold, your God reigns. Glad tidings to proclaim salvation. Desire to this place that has been bombed out, wrecked out. There's this unbelievable description in 2 Kings of the Babylonians jumping up and down running around against the flames as the temple is destroyed. In Ezekiel, God leaves the temple because the people have made it a mockery. Think about those places in our history, maybe those places in your lives where you felt nothing could possibly go right again. I am shut out, as Jonah liked to say. I'm, I went down to where the bar, where the sea reed wrapped about me, where the bars closed over me. I'm cut off from the land of the living, but God will not let anything stand in the way. Remember that great songwriter who unfortunately was under the shadow of Carol King. Uh, Laura Nairo, I'm a woman in love. I will do anything to get you into my heart. I can't let this stuff stand between us. I will bring you home. Remember God's people are in exile. It is the looniest place to give hope. But as I think back of Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag, or Jürgen Modman uh, also in the Gulag, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, the famous German baritone in the, in the Gulag, it was their exile and imprisonment that brought them back to God. And as Fischer Dieskau said, I now just didn't simply hit the right notes. 
soul married my voice. Jürgen Moltmann said, I found hope against hope and hope upon hope. In the impossible places, God reigns. In the bellies of countless things, God reigns if we choose. Remember, time and time again, Exodus was a great, great one in Genesis. They looked in another direction, and there was God. You wacko, look. Look away and see God. And when they looked away, they saw God and then found God in the midst. Think of Hagar, Ishmael, alone in the desert, thrown out. And here, would you leave my child to die in the wilderness? And Hagar looks. And there is a string stream bubbling up that wasn't there before. Abraham, will you have me sacrifice Isaac? And Abraham looks away. There is a lamb stuck in the brambles. Where do we have to look again? Because bidden or unbidden, God is present and that we have received all these things not to just simply fear good feel good but to do good next slide please ah we're at the end are we at the end i do believe yes. we're, we're at the end of today's this 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 point of the discussion wait stay tuned there's more to come because you're blessed to be a blessing. You're saved to serve. You're not just simply there to be the love sponge. You're there to share the good news. The good news does not become the good news totally until it's shared and given. Think of your life when you've reached beyond somewhere and been there for someone. Think of your life, think of your situation. When you left your comfort zone, or when you failed or purposely asked yourself not to listen to the naysayers, but to listen to the God of love. And that's what we'll be discussing next in our next presentation. We're going to take the third part of Isaiah. We've been through the first, remember the first through about the 40th verse, 40, 40th through about the 52nd verse. You want to read something great? Your assignment, your assignment for tonight. Yes, you have an assignment. Isaiah 43, the first through the sixth chapters. This does not sound like your basic Old Testament fire and brimstone. This is a God who is passionate and declares that God is not only with you, for you, and that you are not the sums of your mistakes. You are the sum of God's passionate love and the love that God sees in you that is yet to be. Amen. We'll see you the next time you tune in, and I hope you do. Thank you.